All right. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Alyssa Karpinka, and I am the event coordinator for McNally Robinson in Saskatoon. We are streaming live tonight from Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of the Cree, Soto, Dene, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and Métis nations. We are thrilled to present Michael Tressler launching the History Forest with special guest host Jeremy Desjardins. Thank you both for being here tonight. I'd also like to thank University of Regina Press and especially Melissa Shirley for working with us to create this event. Uh, before we move into the event, I'll share a bit of Zoom housekeeping. We've enabled live auto captions, which you can access along the bottom of your screen by clicking live transcripts. We'll also have a brief Q&A toward the end of the evening, so feel free to submit any questions using the Q&A box. I will now introduce our special guest host for the evening, Jeremy Desjardins. Jeremy is a PhD student in the Department of English at McGill University and the recipient of a Vanier Scholarship. His research interests combine Canadian and Indigenous strains of the long poem, focusing on the ontological and reconciliatory impulses of the genre. Most recently, he taught as a faculty member at the First Nations University of Canada and has worked with the Montreal International Poetry Prize since the spring of 2021. We are so pleased he's joined us tonight. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you so much. Um, so Mike, I will, um, I'm going to excise a, a small section from your, uh, your bio from your recent text and sort of serve it, so treat it as a, as a jumping off point for, for some opening questions that I hope you're excited to talk about. Uh, and I'll just read the final line of your, of your bio. Um, he is an amateur photographer and is a professor of English at the University of Regina. And um, we'll get to that in a moment, um, but I, I guess maybe just by way of introduction, uh, you and I have known each other for quite a long time, um, 10, maybe even close to 15 years, both uh, as professor and student. And then when I was at the English department as well as an instructor, we served on committees together. And I think subsequent to both of those, uh, we, I think we just became friends as it relates to poetry and ideas and texts and cinema and, um, and something that I cherish greatly with you. And I think in a lot of ways, uh, ideally the conversation this evening will revolve around um, you know, such modes of, of interaction through artwork. Um, now, in terms of that last line of your, of your text for the History Forest, your recent text through the University of Regina Press, uh, I'm excited by the tag an amateur photographer. And um, by way of introduction, your collection of poetry here uh, similarly includes a number of photographs. Um, and I'm hoping as a way of beginning that you can, you can discuss the photographs, sort of what they're doing in the text and, um, and largely how you engage with photography, uh, both the, the photographs you produce and those that you look at, engage with, et cetera. And, um, and maybe we'll start there if that's pleasing to you. I'm really glad that you, uh, noticed that. Uh, Jeremy, and I want to thank you for um, participating in this, and I want want to thank McNally Robinson. Uh, yeah, we, you and I, have been fortunate to know each other for any number of years, and uh, I, it's one of the great, the the beauties of being a professor that you meet mm -hmm. so many uh, exciting, you know, profoundly intelligent people, and if you're lucky, you get to uh, stay in touch with them and become friends. And mm -hmm. so I, I'm I'm delighted and grateful that we've been able to do this. Um, photographs, uh, in a nutshell, uh, I was mentioning to Jeremy just a few minutes ago that I just got back from a trip to Europe and I spent some time um, in Amsterdam uh, going to art museums. Uh, and this takes me back to when I was 18 and I did the usual thing for my generation of the backpacking trip to Europe. And I walked into a museum, <clears throat> the Stediak Museum, which is their museum of modern art. And I saw installation artists like uh, Ed Keinholz. I saw photographs. I saw modernism for me for the first time. And I came from a small town in Southern Ontario. And it totally blew my mind that people could think about things like this. And the visual arts thus um, are always part of the way that I think about everything. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the way that I go for a walk in nature, 
uh, and definitely the way that I write. And I found myself in a situation like you a number of years ago, that is to say, working on a dissertation. And I needed to find a way that was separate from thinking about words and writing, you know, 10 hours a day. So I picked up a camera. Hmm. And this was in London, Ontario, and decided that I would essentially go out street photography for eight, 10 hours. And one of the things that amazed me was that uh, in street photography, you don't know what you're looking for until you see it. And then you do. And then form and content coalesce immediately. And so my um, completely amateur uh, response to photography, I mean, I've sold a couple of pictures, but I, I'm an amateur, um, it is something that has made me see the world and interact with the world that is, I think, on a different level than, than writing. Mm. And so to answer your question very specifically, um, photographs are all unique. I mean, they take place within the, the mode of, of photography, but every photograph um, is of something in the world that is ontologically um, separate from other photographs. And so in the very beginning uh, part of the book, there is a photograph of pelicans that uh, is sort of stretched out over the page that is connected to uh, basically a whimsical um, thought experiment dealing with um, uh, triple O and um, uh, various kinds of panpsychism. Hmm. And I wanted the, the birds to be there because of their beauty and also because they sort of stretched out what the poem was trying to do in words. This is utterly different from the photograph at the end of the book, which is of um, a Buddhist temple uh, in, in Regina. Uh, yeah. and, and there very specifically, I was interested in bringing together thematically the essay on Buddhism and of course the Dharma and the cyclist that was at the end um, uh, behind the building that sort of comes into, into the essay. But at the same time, uh, recognize that the image that is captured in the photograph is completely discreet from what the essay is about because it's part of reality. And one of the things that obsesses me and amazes me is how actually rare vision is. And, and so, I mean, when I, when I look at you right now on the screen, I see, you know, the plant, the books, I see the pictures, I see the clothes you're wearing. Um, unless you've got a cat in your lap, uh, you're the only person or the only entity that is seeing. Mm -hmm. Most of the world has got nothing to do with seeing. You know, it, it, it's mute. Um, I hesitate to say blind because that brings in seeing, but it's, it's non-seeing. And that, to me, makes photography a truly special and bizarre uh, thing that we have developed and invented. Okay, lovely. So I'm thinking of a number of things, but the first one to maybe sort of center it on some of the poems within the text um, would be your your or the speaker's obsession with birding and the sort of ornithological impulse. And I think that there's something interestingly different about capturing through photography and then sort of merely looking uh, the the individual who's armed with binoculars and the scope. And uh, and I, I guess maybe as a secondary question, what suddenly then is the difference between capturing in photographic form and then a potential gracefulness in just in just looking uh, through through the binocular? Uh, they're both sort of scopic. They're both based in vision. Um, there is a subject and an object sort of inter interchanging with one another, but but one captures and one contains. And as you say, it's ontologically and phenomenologically unique. And so with the poems that sort of are excited by looking um, almost for the, the sole means of looking as opposed to capturing. Uh, how, how does that differ for you than what the, what the photographs produce in you or produce for you in the reading of the book? Um, you, you've hit one of the major subtexts or sub themes of the book, which is, is of course looking. 
And in the 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 final essay, there's a little meditation on binoculars. Mm -hmm. And it's it's precisely what you've just said, which is that at least with current technology, although I expect it's going to change very soon, um, binoculars um, are not something that allow you to keep anything. Yes. You don't own what you see. And <clears throat> for me, using binoculars almost always with birding allows me to sort of, in a Husslerian sense, bracket myself as a human being and immerse myself in um, a landscape or a birdscape or a marshscape that is actually quite foreign to the human um, experience because we see things that we're, I hesitate to say, not supposed to see, but that we're, we're not part of. And to me, this is an extraordinary gift mm -hmm. uh, to be able to, to, to lose the self. Um, Photography is different. It's not necessarily um, acquisitive, but it, it does manage to, uh, forgive the pun, but frame something and then potentially keep it. Whereas with binoculars, this is, this is not the case. And I find that binoculars insert you into time and then kick you out of it at the same time. Whereas photography, as we know, you know from Sontag and Bart, uh, is very, very much um, a sort of a, a phenomenology of time. Mm -hmm. Key to this, as you've noted, is birds. Yeah. Um, and I spend my time wondering a lot how they perceive the world, um, how they see it. Um, I know from my readings in science that their their eyes, of course, are much more complicated than ours. Um, they can see a much wider range. Their hearing actually is quite similar to ours. We hear things similar to what the way birds do. But I find myself wondering how birds exist in reality with their vision. And sometimes I'll be very lucky and I'll just come across a bird that is that is just sitting. It's not eating, it's not flying. It's not preening. It's not. It's not doing anything. It's just sitting, and it must be in its own way thinking. Yeah. What does that mean? I have no idea, but I, I think that binoculars give me a a kind of an intimation of what that might be, and that uh, then leads to the next thing, which is that the book is obsessed with color. Yeah. Is color is is one of the great gifts that we have. Okay, so I think in 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 your many portraits in the act of portraiture, in your many portraits of birds, um, in many ways we're getting a a portrait of you as a thinker, as a writer, as a philosopher, etc., as a birder. Um, so I want to make a brief case to you, and I'll, I'll sort of spit back a few lines of your own poetry back to you and see if, if this is compelling at all. Um, with the two works uh, that are sort of side by side in the early sections of the book, uh, Apparitions and then We're Left Beginning, you do nearly an identical thing in both poems. And that is, again, the, the, the scopic looker, the armed with binoculars, armed with effectively lenses of all sorts, looks uh, often at birds, but in one is at an otter. And then you immediately and sort of epiphanically transition into a rumination on visual artwork, okay? And, and, and one is an immediate leap to the next. And it's quite jarring, in fact, um, it's abrupt, but there's an obvious thematic link in, in sort of the, tra the, the movement from one scene or one sort of environment to the, to the latter. So let me just sort of address this uh, and it will relate to color as well, as you say. Um, so with the first poem that I'm speaking of with apparitions, you say, um, it leaves the rocks and chooses the water in a way that's close to how wind moves through a branch of aspen in the rain. And then a little bit later, standing near the colors Monet placed on a canvas 100 years ago, I share the consequences of exchanging breath, met on a bridge made solid by chaos and care, okay? And there's another instance of this in the, in the second poem. Uh, this would be on 21, if anyone happens to have their texts with them. 
I'll read the whole section because it's glorious. I don't know if you've seen bluebirds before, but they're a sentient variety of blues, purples, blacks, in glow and dab and a kind of swim song of even yet another blue, not remotely turquoise, but resonant of it. I haven't been so delighted to live inside a color since seeing Bruegel's green sky in the painting Hunters in the Snow some years ago. So again, just to kind of reframe this pattern that I think is going on, there's this immersion in a, a relationship to the natural world through looking, but it reminds the speaker of visual art. And we sort of transport from natural space to a kind of a human-made gallery space. And so why is that an operation in your book? I, I understand you have a great love of, of both spaces and both both acts of looking in, in those various contexts, but but why that transition? And, and what, what is that technique doing for you as the writer and, and how much you anticipate what it does to the reader? I think that painters understand the world differently than writers do. Mm -hmm. And I I look at um, Bregel's Hunters in the Snow, which is fascinating in terms of its content and its form and it's playing around with form. But it, it's to me, its major accomplishment is the color of the sky that, that Bregel ha has made, knowing that it is changed and deteriorated since he he first mm. painted it um and with with the the monet um this was a an exhibit in vancouver and many of the paintings were um from very late in his life when uh he had cataracts very badly and they uh were nonetheless uh brilliant and they they sort of were crazy and wild in a way that Jackson Pollock would do maybe 40 years after him. But Monet's was was different. And so to be clear, I I find myself looking at painters almost as though I'm eavesdropping, forgive the mixing of the symbol or the metaphor there, but I'm looking in on people whose primary relationship with the world is color. Yeah. Um, and design, uh, but but color and the painters that I'm most um, curious about, like Rothko and Monet, color is more important to them than than design. And so I'm like a, a little kid at a candy store um, and sort of looking at what they do with with paint and and color. And I'm just sort of gobsmacked. It's to me. There's not a distinction between the bluebird and um, and Bregel. Yeah. I see them almost both as as manifesting uh, this mode of being that is so absolutely wonderful and so different from lining up words and and that sort of thing. the The other thing is that uh, almost so much of reality I hate and so much of this book is is relating in some way with the evil and the atrocity that human beings inflict upon each other and inflict upon the natural world um, so I, I guess an example of this uh, that is most clear in terms of color is a, a, um, a mini poem dealing with the statue in near Waskana Lake uh, to the Holodomor or Stalin's enforced starvation of Ukraine. And it begins um, talking about orange because there's an oriole nearby and, it, and the poem mutates from the color of the oriole to the color, strangely, that the jumpsuits that ISIS and the Americans use for prisoners. And it's not a visual, uh, it's not a painting, but the statue is, of course, a, a kind of a, a visual art. And to me, color is is the relief hmm. from this pain and this loss. It's it's like it's something that is that is not quite an antidote because it's not a binary. But the the other thing that obsesses me about color is that, in some respects, color is eternal. 
in a way that words are not. And what, what I mean by this is that um, you can see a Baltimore Oriole and it's orange. And I can show you a photograph of a Baltimore Oriole and the orange is the same. Now that that is so unique in our experiences as a mediated culture because everything that we do is mediated, but color is not. Color has got an ontological verity, whether it's in a photograph or whether it's in a movie or whether it's in the natural um, world. And I think that writers can't help but be intensely jealous of that. <laughs> well, I find what you're saying, I I'm gobsmacked in a certain way because I'm severely colorblind. And right. so these are these are fascinating um, these are fascinating ways that you intuit and sort of involve yourself with the world in ways that that I don't and in certain ways that's why I'm so appreciative of language and written language because it's mm. often black and white quite actually uh, sure. I, I don't need to sort of decode something that I'm sort of incapable of decoding um, the, the the image of of the bird and, and the immediate continuity with jumpsuits uh, for the the prisoners out of the U.S. and ISIS uh, it reminds me of a phrase in in the final sort of long I think of it as a long poem but in the text you term it as an essay uh, bodhisattva um, you you use the phrase uh, simultaneity bewilders me and those those three words. Um, I think summarize the book in a lot of ways, right? That there's a sort of a curious blurb-like effect in that. Because I think in so many ways, you almost constantly are uh, arrested by such bewilderment, right? How, how can this beauty remind me of something that is atrocious? Mm -hmm. How can this natural world remind me of the gallery space? How can a present moment instantly shoot me back in time, right? And that, that simultaneity is is a very kind of a uh, useful and, and obviously a sort of an unstoppable effect I, I see in a lot of your poetry. Um, I'm wondering then if you could sort of expand upon that that sort of comment. Simultaneity bewilders me. What does it What does it mean to be bewildered by um, by beauty and then also by atrocity? And, and why is that sort of binary? Um, why is it so present? I've spent most of my adult life trying to understand that, and I'm not sure that I do. But uh, I was a, a very privileged, um, lucky child. Um, grew up in a small town in Southern Ontario in the 1960s, uh, middle class. My father was a teacher, my mother was a nurse. And uh, it was fairly ideal in many respects. And this is something that happened to 20th century children that I don't think happens to 21st century children. Um, we were bombarded by the fact, or by, I can't say the fact, we were bombarded by adults telling us that the 20th century is the best thing that ever happened. It was constant. The 20th century is, is absolutely the most happening kind of thing that has ever occurred. And of course, this was the 60s. Uh, my sisters and I had a babysitter who was a Beatles fan. I remember going over to her house and seeing almost life-size photos of Beatles in the garage. And so we were, we were taught that the 20th century was really, really important. But the problem was that my parents subscribed to Life magazine. And I remember sitting in the basement, paging through the Life magazine and seeing portraits of the death camps and seeing photographs that the US military would not allow to be um, um, put in a magazine mm -hmm. that would be going to people across the country of Vietnam. And it struck me as impossible to understand that I could be sitting there and, and go out and get a fudgesicle or whatever and Vietnam was taking place and the pictures were there. And when I started doing a little bit of arithmetic, I realized that my parents who were both born in 1939, that had they been born Jewish in Poland in 1939, we would all be dead. Mm -hmm. And so this then, it, it, it took hold of my imagination, but also my fear um, that 
I mean, we know this right now, and because of technology, we can we can grasp it in a way that was different from what Bregel did. I mean, Bregel did not know what was taking place in Japan while he was doing that painting, but we know about an earthquake in Indonesia, and we know about the terrible things that are taking place in Ukraine. And how do we manage to put that together? You know, the, you and I are, are speaking about a book of poetry while these other things are, are taking place this very, very second. Mm -hmm. That struck me as being fundamentally unjust when I was a child, and it has never gone away. Mm -hmm. And so uh, maybe this is because of my mood disorders that I'm I'm never really entirely capable of being 100% happy for long. The other always creeps in. Um, very, very briefly, in another book, I talk about going to see the Bregel painting in Vienna and the next day going to Mauthausen concentration camp. And to, to try to understand how Bregel's painting, which is probably one of the very few justifications for us as human beings to be alive, if we can do this, there's something good about us. Mm -hmm. But only three hours away is Mauthausen. And when Mauthausen was taking place, people were looking at Bregel. Yeah. And I mean, how do you, well, I can't, but I suppose the flip side is that it's provided content for several books. Right. Well, and it would be cliche to say that, that that is ineffable because in fact, then you wouldn't have poetry or wouldn't have the, the propulsion to create in the, in the first place. And so I think what your text is often doing, and I think this is a commonality amongst most of your works, is, is an attempt to compute what is incomputable mm -hmm. uh write about what you know can't or shouldn't or is is too complicated to write about um as it relates to uh kind of a very different theme but again it's it's constant throughout your text um you this is a very gestural book um a lot of epigraphs that, that put you in dialogue with other authors uh artists generally uh, within the poems, uh, your, your family is, is almost ever present, and and I think thirdly, um, you you name you name a lot of art. Right, we've, we've been speaking about that already. Um, what I feel uh, after having read the, the text a number of times is this is a book that's in fact quite excited by and interested in community, and. I'm wondering if that resonates with you as a, as a sort of descriptor of a text, uh, a book that is looking for or at least celebrating community, uh, however one might define that. And, and if that's true, um, does that seem to be some sort of antidote or some sort of response to, to atrocity, to trauma, to the solipsism that might take hold in 20th and 21st century consciousness? Well, thank you for that, Jeremy. I, I've never thought about it in those terms. And in, in actual fact, I've never even noticed it. Um, so and that's a a really interesting thing um, for me to, to ponder. And I'll have to do more of that in the future. Think about what you're saying. Um, my initial response is that to go back to childhood, I was a very lonely kid because um, I had friends, some very good friends that I, I still am friends with now. But I found that what bothered me about life and so forth, nobody else really cared about, um, very few people at least. And um, small town Ontario in the 60s, as Alice Monroe has pointed out, was profoundly anti-intellectual um art was basically pictures of Mennonites sitting on fences to some extent. Um, and so I I found uh, Albert Camus was was one of the first that I found that I read Camus when I went, holy shit. Mm -hmm. I get it. Mm -hmm. And and not only that, he's talking about the things that bother me. I mean, I read The Rebel and I went, yes, absolutely. And so 
I, I realized that in terms of community, that there was this enormous community out there, but it just wasn't part of, you know, my high school, mm -hmm. um, with some exceptions. Um, and that was a, a tremendous, tremendous joy to realize that mostly in Europe, people were thinking about the things that I was thinking about, or actually to be more accurate, I was thinking of just stumbling into what they've been thinking about for a very long time. Hence, what you've noticed. Um, I, I, I feel a tremendous affinity to, to so many writers and, and painters and photographers that it, it, it's, this is kind of mystical and slap trap, but I sometimes think that there's an ongoing project to try to actually define what human reality is like, and not just human reality. I mean, the reality of, of the non-human. And it, it's like, we're all just sort of adding a little bit or shining a little bit of a flashlight on one corner. And so, some are, you know, brilliant, like, you know Jan's wiki. I mean, she's in this book all over the place. Uh, yeah, her her work is uh, just stunning to me. Um, and then the the painters that we've been speaking about. I mean, Bregel and and various others, and they open up such huge huge spaces for us to see and and think. But yeah, it's it's such a joy. And I mean, we you mentioned at the beginning that you know we we met. Uh, at university and surely that's got to be one of the best things there is when you know people like you and and others that we get to understand that we're just part of this enormous and it's a cliche but it's true this enormous conversation that yeah. has been taking place probably since somebody first decided to put their hand up against a wall in a cave and blow paint around it and that is, yes, very, very definitely um, a kind of, if not a resistance, a kind of feeling of of relief from those that don't want that. You know, mm -hmm. the Nazis and and so forth. They want to destroy that kind of thing. And so, yeah, you're you're absolutely right that there is this there is this wonderful community, and to be part of it is 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 so joyful. I mean, that's. Well, you um, you use the word delight many times in this collection, and and that's that can be a tricky word because that there, there's something almost um, sacred about feeling delight, and and delightfulness is is a hard thing to articulate, and it's also I think a rare emotion to actually have, and. Mm -hmm. And you use the word, and I think you expound upon it in, in many instances in the text. Um, I think you have multiple sources of delight, uh, which again, as, as a sort of a compatriot of yours, a friend of yours, that, that makes me happy. Uh, I, I'm thrilled that, that people around me are delighted and that they can sort of exchange that um, with one another. Um, there's, a, there's a constant... As I said earlier, there's sort of a gesture, gesture towards other poets, Zwicky, Don Coles, um, the painters that we've mentioned. There's this sort of interesting, uh, I know the poems stop at the end when you write your notes at the end of the text, but there's sort of an interesting uh, instance of anaphora when you, you use the phrase, this poem is for, and then blank. And I think you do that three or four times. This poem is for Jan Zwicky, this poem is for Don Coles, et cetera, right? And I was struck by that phrase because it feels like a gift. Right? I'm gifting these po poems outwards and elsewhere. Um, there's, a, there's a section as well in which you use the word gifts. Uh, in, in the poem I mentioned earlier, uh, We're Left Beginning, and you say, sustaining this long friendship with you has marked me with unanticipated gifts. And even though we only meet occasionally, you've taught me that it's best for words like days to begin and then end simply. Um, gifts um do you do you anticipate artwork uh books etc cetera, etc cetera, as as a 
type of gift exchange, right? Does it does it sort of do things resonate with you in that sense that you are you're bestowed something when you're in a gallery, when you're reading a book, when you're stood in nature? And do you think of it as as gifts in that sense, the way you you sort of name it a number of times in the collection? Oh, uh, absolutely, um, I, abs- absolutely, and entirely. Um, I I have been very very fortunate to receive gifts like this. Mm. Um, whether it's from Don Coles, who I met when I was in my early twenties, or as you say, um, being in, being in a gallery, um, I, I, in another book, um, I attempt to talk to a painting that Vermeer did, and um, it's it's this. How do you put it? There's nothing that I can do to adequately express my gratitude to Vermeer mm-hmm. or to to Jan Zwicky or to to Don or to Ed Kineholtz or to an Oriole. Um, I I can't. I'm. It, it's not quite the um, you know Bill and Ted unworthy, unworthy, unworthy in front of Alice Cooper, but. Uh, almost always these things take me by surprise. Yeah. And it's like, I didn't wake up this morning thinking that something like this was going to happen. And sometime this morning is like, I didn't think for the last couple of years that something like this was going to happen. Uh, And so... I would be, I'm not going to say that my poems to these four people, to Philip Cherrier and others, is my give back to them because I can't. I, I mm. can't really adequately give something, but I want it to be recognized. And um, Don said something to me. Um, we were having lunch. Uh, whenever I went back to Toronto, I'd always go and see him. And we were talking about... Um, Ingmar Bergman's films we both loved, particularly The Light. Mm -hmm. And Don said to me something that I've never forgotten. He said to me that when you see the light in a Bergman film, especially in the beginning, you realize that it is something that is never going to bring harm into the world. And geez, when he said that, I thought, exactly. You know, I exactly it is it is not going to bring harm into the world Hmm. and what what greater gift is there than something like that that it exists but it's not going to hurt anything it's not going to harm anyone it's not going to harm anything and when when you're in the vicinity of that um and for me, it was Don that uh, Grano was his favorite restaurant. When you're in the vicinity of that, you just realize you you're just so lucky hmm. you know, to 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 feel or to feel what that means, but to be offered that. And I mean, we all have these things, right? I mean, we everyone has got things in their life that that touch them and and they're grateful to to have, and they come from outside. They're they're nothing that you did. And they, that's why they're gifts. They, they're, you couldn't begin to make them. Like who, you know, you just can't. And I think something that you're uh, sort of speaking around is that one reason that they're gifts is that they're unex- they're unexpected, right? They, they, they're truly uh, unanticipated and therefore epiphanic, um, mm-hmm. profound. And, and there's, a, there's a humbling of the self when, when being given something and having to now interact with the, the unexpected gift. Um, I was wondering if you, I know you and I wanted to sort of just converse as it were in, in this setting here, but, but I would also, and I'm sure those in attendance would love if you would read a poem or two, uh, if you feel comfortable with that, um, is that something that you would turn to right now at this point? Sure. Um, uh, I'll just, why don't I just look at, um, the poem that I mentioned that is concerning the statue. Um, mm. For those of us who live in Regina, you when you walk around Boscana Lake, you you will you will notice this um, this terrible 
um, statue of a, a small a girl um, and she's clearly a peasant and you know this is in dedication to the victims of the Holodomor that as I say Stalin's enforced starvation of the people of Ukraine uh, recently of course because of Putin um, there have been several wreaths or there will be UK Ukrainian flags there and so the the poem was written before the invasion of Ukraine but um, it's 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 one of those things that it's we talked about simultaneity simultaneity takes place in time and geography but it also takes place in the past and i i think that you know the terrible things that happened in ukraine in the 30s and the terrible things that happened in saskatchewan you know in the 19th century in the 18th century they're still here mm -hmm. the slender girl is too young to know that the orange belly of the oriole singing behind her matches the prisoner jumpsuits used by both the Americans and ISIS. She's also only recently taken her place here, a statue, a true to life size commemoration of the Holodomor. She stands standing alongside a man made lake in Canada's undeserted prairies. Is there a mental illness inherent to statues, their need to displace air, to occupy where the mind keeps fraying, to be islands that supplicate, to breathe what imagination can't ignite? She's an abandoned souvenir, an exhausted and unwavering resilience that seethes. Um, the other, I'll just read another brief one and I'll use a prop. Um, this is a toy plastic um, statue of an Australopithecus. Um, I learned about Australopithecuses because my father was a teacher and he had a nice library. Um, actually, in terms of gratitude, my parents read to me when I was a child all the mm -hmm. time. And that goes deep and yeah. so in many respects all of my poems are to don coles but they're also to my parents who read to me mm -hmm. anyway i was sitting and looking at this statue and i thought she's made out of plastic and she was alive millions of years ago what would she think of us so that's what the poem's about and so it's dedicated to lucy um who which is the name um given to one of the first uh, Australopithecus is uh, because the Beatles were in the background. So this is as unnoticed as possible, and it's for Lucy, our first mother. There's almost always two of them. Mother and, or mother with, her child up against a tilting shoulder, a breast about to tire and four separate hands each gathering its own task, each finger an enunciation of trust, care. And this particular pair, an almost young Australopithecus looking far away down into the distance, yet beneath and between us, her offspring, a toddler mesmerized by something looming behind what's already here. This ancestral pair, the color of sun tape over shadow, is factory made from plastic, is conjured from the gasoline haze above the playground in the toy city. An unforeseen cosmopolis done in by polymers, some in the neonatal intensive care unit and others inside are luminous and ever improving toothpaste. River run and infinite regress of bodies. These Instagram islands, a floating montage from me across to you, from that jet trail passing instantly to itinerant sea star to whatever gods hummingbirds once knew, the telepathic and invisible one, she's anxious for me to learn, panic being something we both know. I don't know if Lucy would have thought that, but it was an interesting thing to think about.
I, I find it uh, curious and interesting that both one both poems that you've read are sort of dealing with the uh, miniaturized feminine perspective right? and uh, the sort of statification, the uh, plasticization of ancestry and of history, and what an irony it is to sort of deal with the the infinitude of a of a piece of plastic, but in fact uh, reminds us of something profound in the past. Um, I think somewhere in this digital space, Alyssa, our host, is in the, the background. And I guess maybe I'll just gesture to you, Alyssa, at this point. And if there were some questions from the proverbial field or anyone that you're interacting with, I wonder if we can gesture to that. Um, I'll have a look at the chat here. Um... And maybe while you're looking, I will just sort of ask like another question, if that's suitable. Um, Mike, I'm just sort of, um, I'm interested, maybe this is too long of a question or potentially too long of an answer, but um, I'm interested in the long the long works in this collection. Right? You you refer to the last uh, poem, Bodhisattva on a Bicycle, as an essay within, within the text itself. Um, and yet again, I, my, my training is thinking of it as a long prosaic poem. Mm -hmm. And and you have sort of long multi-page poems as well, and and I think that you you seem to be heading in that direction, uh, if I might sort of intimate at that. And and I'm wondering what is what is longer work doing for you as a thinker and as a poet, um, as opposed to shorter, brief, uh, almost aphoristic poems uh, that that exist here and elsewhere in other collections. You have. Um... BP Nickel behind you in your bookshelf. Uh, I was very fortunate at York University to have him do a couple of creative writing classes that I was in. Mm. And uh, I also did work with Eli Mandel. And uh, Eli's favorite poem was Charles Olson's The Maximus Poems. Yes. And I think that, uh, so then as a very young man, uh, the prospect of, of working on a, a very long piece, and indeed for these poets like B.P. Nickel and to some extent Olson, a lifelong project um, is tremendously appealing mm. to me. I mean, I, I think I, I follow um, Stephen Ross Smith, his uh, Flutter Tongue. Flutter Tongue, yeah. Um, it, it, there's something utterly beautiful about being able to work with something and relax with it. Um, so uh, one of the reasons that I read the poem about the Holodomor statue and the um, the poem about the Australopithecus toy is because one of the techniques that I very much enjoy is to have sort of motifs rippling through the text. So these two poems actually speak to each other. Yeah. And I, I really like you know, what someone like William Carlos Williams can do in his poem, Patterson, that my sister Patty gave to me. Mm -hmm. But he can pick up something in the first, second page, and then 60 pages later, come back and, and change it. There's something very, very beautiful about that. Um, right now, when I'm working on a new collection of poetry, I'm trying to do the exact opposite. I, I'm trying to write poems that take place on, on only one page. And I'm mm -hmm. finding it very difficult because I, I'm my my pace or gait is for a longer piece. Um, and similarly with essays, I'm trying to write essays that are 1500 words or less because I'm trying to learn brevity. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it's very, very difficult. Um, but I think that there are there are joys for both the reader and the writer in the long piece um, that uh, well, were probably built into me in my early 20s. My favorite writer is Proust. Yeah. And I mean, he's the master of the long piece where you get an image on page 30 and whoa, you know, 1100 pages later, it, it comes back. I, I love that. Yeah, it's funny to. I think you you said that. Uh, I don't think you said comfort, but but that there's something comforting in being able to settle into a long poem as an author, a writer, and and I think in a lot of ways 
uh, a lot of long poets privately speak about the uh, <laughs> the insanity of trying to sustain that, right? right. The, the the complexity, the 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 writerly fortitude that's required to to write something like the Martyrology, to write something like Patterson, um, even Eliot with Wasteland and so forth. Um, mm. That um, one of the major puns within that field, and Eli Mandel sort of created it, is the the life sentence. Yeah. Right? That, that I'm struck by the attempt at sort of making this poem one thing, one continuous monographic, monolithic piece, and yet there's something imprisoning about it. Uh, I, I'm sort of tied to it. Um, mm -hmm. It is a life sentence in that um, imprisoning sense. And, and so are, are you thinking then that that shorter works or that that gesture towards brevity is is a different avenue for you to sort of be freed? from uh, the, the potential complexities of long works? Um, I don't want to repeat myself. Sure. And so it's, I think that you, you continually try to do things that you're not good at. Mm. And uh, I really admire, I, I'm working with a, a student right now who is capable of using five lines and somehow compressing an enormous amount of images and, and raw data in five lines. And I, I really, really admire that. Um, and so I'm trying to do it. And, I, and there, of course, is a similarity between taking a photograph and writing a very brief poem. Um, I, I think that there's there's something gnomic about the possibility of, of brevity that turns itself upon the mystery of language itself because mm -hmm. the words the words become their own living creature in a way that is slightly different than in a longer piece where words are sort of commingling and to use a word you used earlier, community. Whereas there's something raw and stark and almost alchemical about something that's very, very brief. And like I say, I'm not good at it. And so I'm I'm trying to to practice to practice it and see what it can do. Um, but I, I've written almost all of this new collection, but I'm telling myself I'm going to give myself the freedom now to write a poem that's five, six pages long. Mm -hmm. and put it in there that's great um I, I don't really see any questions coming in from the uh the attendees um and so maybe if we're winding down here as we've almost reached an hour um i'll just maybe kind of close with a final question to you mike um you've, you've sort of intimated at it with with dealing with shorter works um but i i'm sort of largely wondering um you've had a like a very prolific year year and a half with with publications and so on one hand kudos and congrats and i'm sure that's deeply satisfying to have had a number of books come out um and i my question is uh, not simply what's next but um you've mentioned uh, the need or desire to challenge yourself as you say to engage with the type of writing that that you're not good at uh, and, and to to better it and to better yourself through that process so my question is what is sort of coming what is coming next for you generally um are you are you wanting to focus more on photographs are you wanting to focus more on short brief poems and essays are you interested in painting or music uh, as a way of of expanding what what you're sort of releasing and and, and putting out. Do you have thoughts on well, what's sort of next, as it were? Briefly, yes. I have no talent for music, so I won't even begin to do that. Um, I just I'm not like you. I I can't do it or your brother. Um, I'm working on another book of essays. Hmm. Um, as I mentioned to you before the the event tonight, I just got back from Europe. Yeah. I went to some Holocaust sites. I, of course, went to art museums, and I want to to write another book along those lines. I'm also interested in exploring some different topics. 
um, I'm very, very interested in self-delusion. Hmm. And I'm very interested in how we deny what we know, whether it's the climate crisis or whatever happens in our personal life. And this is an area of inquiry that is new to me. I mean, yeah. there's tons of very fascinating material out there on the denial of reality. And mm. so I'm beginning to to explore that. Um, and I, I hope to continue working with, with photography. Um, Philip Cherrier and, um, uh, has helped me with that. And um, Don Hall has, and we're thinking the three of us of putting on another show at, at one point. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a few things I want to get done and thought out um, before I lose my capacity to write, as it were. Uh, and those are those are deep ones, and and also to to try to think more deeply into what the Anthropocene means. Of course, I mean, this book touches on it. Yeah, uh, but I want to go deeper. Yeah, that's about it. Well, that's that's great. I think it's um, it's multi pronged, it's multifaceted, um, but so to speak, it's colorful, right? To use some of your language, it's it's interested in in range. And that's that's great to great to hear right? that you're um, you're wanting to continue on in different avenues. Um, Alyssa, might might I just sort of bring you back in here? Um, I think we're coming to that proverbial natural end, and so I'm wondering if you can close us out, if need be. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you both so much for being with us tonight. Um, thank you to everyone at University of Regina Press. Uh, we've got copies of The History Forest available for sale in-store and online at mcnallyrobinson.com. Uh, thank you to all of our attendees tonight. And again, thank you so much, Michael and Jeremy, for being here. What a wonderful thank evening. Thank you, Alyssa. And thank, thank you so much, you. Jeremy. That was a lot of fun. I wish yeah. you lived closer. It's an irony that I'm I'm so far away, and yet we're seemingly spending more time together uh, in these ways. But uh, yes, thank you as well. It was lovely. Thank you to both of you. Okay. Thank you so much, guys. Have a good night. All right. Bye-bye.